Good morning and welcome to the uh, special budget committee meeting for December 15th, 2020. Um, the main order of business today is going to be reviewing the uh, fiscal sustainability uh, framework and I would like to call this meeting to order. Um, and before we get started, I am going to go through and do an audio check uh, of each of the councillors and uh, the head staff. So from District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Here and present and uh, in a nice little snowy fall river. Oh, super. Welcome. Uh, Councillor Hensby, District 2. Ho, 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 from Eastern Shore. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kent, have you been able to join us yet? No, okay. Uh, Councillor Purdy from District 4. Hi, yes, I was able to get back in just now. So hi, Councillor Russell and everyone. Folks, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Austin from District 5. I'm here, Mr. Chair, and ready to go. Super, thank you. Uh, Councillor Mancini, <coughs> District 6. Okay. Uh, Councillor Mason from District 7. Uh, here, uh, accounted for, present, ready to go, Mr. Chair. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith from District 8. Here, ready to count some money. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cleary from District 9. Uh, I am here sitting in front, as you can see, the beautiful Dingle Tower in Sir Sanford Fleming Park, representing District 9, Mr. Chair. That's good. The boat that you're on looks very stable. It's a nice day out today. It is. It is a nice day. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Morse from District 10. Good morning, colleagues from City Hall. Ah, good morning. Uh, Councillor Cuddle from District 11. Councillor Cuddle, you're still muted. There we go. Sorry, I'm having some problems with my screen here. I am here from Crystal's Cove in District 11. Oh, Hello, good everyone. Stuff. Good morning and welcome. Uh, Councillor Stoddard from District 12. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and fellow councillors. Um, it's a light snow out here in Timberley. I'm proud to be part of District 12. Good stuff. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Lovelace from District 13. Good morning, colleagues. I'm joining you from District 13, Hammonds Plain, St. Margaret's. Super, thank you. And uh, Councillor Black from Burn from District 14. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're coming to you live from the GBA, the Greater Beaver Bank area this morning. There we go. Thank you. And Deputy Mayor Outfit. Good morning from Bedford. I see tree leases. Well, yeah, get it, get it. Oh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm here all week, Mr. Chair. I yes. uh, well, good morning and good morning to everybody. Looking forward to this. Have fun. Thank you. Uh, our tickets. And Mr. Mayor. I'm here, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and Mr. CAO. I'm here and, and uh, account accounted for. Thank you very much. Super, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Traves. Sorry, Mr. Traves. For, Mr. James, we're backwards. Yep, thank you. Uh, and uh, the CFO. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Good morning and uh, good to see everybody is here except uh, for Councillor Kent and Councillor Mancini. So hopefully they will be able to join us shortly. Um, so the second item on the agenda is the approval minutes of uh, December 1st, 2020. Uh, can I please get a motion to approve the minutes of December 20? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second, okay. Councillor Cleary. Super, thank you. Uh, any discussion on those minutes? Okay, all in favor of those minutes uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Super, thank you. We would normally have public participation. We had called for that this morning. Uh, however, for today's budget meeting, no speakers signed up by the deadline of 
4.30 p.m. yesterday. Uh, as a reminder of those watching, uh, you need to sign up by 4.30 p.m. on the business day prior to the meeting. So we will move ahead to the fiscal sustainability strategy as presented by uh, our CFO, Jane Fraser, with uh, Bruce Fisher. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jane Fraser, Executive Director of Finance, Asset Management, and ICT. Uh, with me today is, as you all know, is Bruce Fisher, who is my Manager of Financial Planning and Fiscal Policy. Uh, this morning, we're going to be introducing the Fiscal Sustainability Strategy. Um, the purpose of this morning's presentation is to introduce you to some of the changes uh, we are recommending to make in the way that we manage our finances internally. This is being driven in part by the growth that we've been seeing in, in HRM prior to COVID and some of the larger strategic initiatives that Council has approved. The fiscal sustainability strategy is a long-term plan to keep HRM on a steady financial path so that we continue to uh, grow and deliver services in a planned and deliberate manner. Ideally, revenue growth, which in, in the case of municipalities by and large in Nova Scotia is, is tax increases um, should really be a steady and predictable path. What you want to do from a, from a, a fiscal plan point of view, uh, fiscal policy is to uh, even out any peaks and troughs. So you want to um, instill certainty uh, for planning purposes. Uh, internally, we've been describing the fiscal sustainability framework as a financial speed limit. Um, so if, if you go too slow, uh, you're not going to get to where you want to be when you need to be there. So you're not going to be able to deliver on, have the funds to deliver on services or your commitments. And then by the same token, if you go too quickly, you're introducing um, unnecessary risk in, in your plan. Some of the things that we will be discussing uh, today through the strategy are things like fairness and equity in, in taxation, as well as debt levels. So, for example, with the introduction of uh, rapid transit and electrification of the fleet, should we be looking at increases to uh, the transit tax? So the people that are benefiting from uh, the services are the ones that are paying for it. Uh, with Halifax 2050, that's a very large, ambitious plan um, for the municipality. Should we be looking at introducing uh, green debt as an example in order to, uh, to move those initiatives along? So it's really looking at the opportunity to fund these large city building initiatives um, now that we have time for pl to, to plan for it, rather than being forced into a, a decision when it, when it comes time to, to find the funding for these. So to use the speed limit analogy, it's, it's doing about 105 in the 100 kilometer speed limit as opposed to 65. So at this time, we will not be uh, seeking recommendations on changes to either debt levels, reserve, uh, or tax rates. Today is mainly about the introduction to the policy behind um, fiscal sustainability and some of the some of the steps that we will be exploring. We are currently scheduled to come back uh, to this committee uh, January the 20th to talk about strategic initiatives. Um, and at that time, that's when we will be uh, making recommendations uh, that we'll be discussing today uh, and hopefully get approved through the fiscal sustainability strategy. And at that time, we will have them linked to specific um, initiatives as well as, as capital projects. So with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to, to Bruce and, and he'll go through the components of the strategy. Um, then we'll open it up to, uh, to questions and really look forward to, uh, to the debate and conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and committee members and Bruce, if, if you're ready to start the presentation. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Council. My name is Bruce Fisher. I'm the Manager of Financial Policy and Planning. This is the Fiscal Sustainability Strategy. It was put together within finance and, and working on the strategy were, were a number of people, including Kenzie McNeil, Andre McNeil, and Nisa Pepic. So uh, um, could we uh, go to the next slide, please? So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about what is the fiscal sustainability strategy. We're going to go through our current policy state. Where are we right now? We're going to talk about why a strategy is needed and we're going to go through the recommended policy changes. And next slide, please. 
So just to give you a, a little bit of a background here, fiscal sustainability, that's the ability to provide and maintain your programs without resorting to unplanned increases or rates or services. And as Jane said, these are the speed limits or the traffic rules as to how you proceed. That's laying the foundation for your long-term goals. So the analogy that I would use is <clears throat> it's not quite the same as fiscal health or fiscal capacity. Fiscal health tells you about how robust your financial position is right now. Fiscal capacity tells you about how much you can actually raise and spend, whereas fiscal sustainability is really telling us whether or not we can maintain those levels. So to use the fitness uh, analogy, fiscal health is about our level of fitness. Fiscal capacity tells us how strong we are and fiscal sustainability tells us about our endurance. So obviously all of those are related, but today we want to discuss and decide on the sustainability and what types of policies and actions we need to work on as we grow larger. And the reason that this is so important is that as we're growing larger and we want to provide key and critical services, which are bigger and bigger, we need to think about that sustainability. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> While we were preparing the strategy, we took an in-depth look at the state of our, our finances and the various policies that support that. We tend to divide those key policy areas into four areas. So there are operating and taxes, debt, capital, and reserves. And you can think about this much as you would think about your own home. So in your own home, you have an income and you have daily expenses such as groceries, gas for the car, those sorts of things. Uh, you also have debt, which may be the mortgage on your home. You have your assets, which would be the house, the car, maybe a boat. And then you have the reserves, which is your equivalent, our equivalent of savings accounts. So all of these things obviously relate very closely to each other. The basic concepts are all very much the same. The operating helps pay for the debt and helps fund the capital. Uh, anything that's left over goes to reserves. The reserves are used to save for future events. Uh, <clears throat> some key points about this. So when we looked at operating, we did a trend line going back many years. We saw steady, consistent growth over the past 10 years. Our municipal expenses have grown in line with inflation and with the rise in the number of new homes. So in the last 10 years, we've had 22,000 new homes. All of those homes require services and the cost of services rises for the municipality to just as inflation affects everyone else. We have benchmarked our taxes and we know where those are. Uh, our debt is essentially a low and declining debt and are in terms of our capital, we have the capacity to deliver roughly about $150 million per year in, capacity, in capital. That's not enough to actually fund many of the larger aspirations that we have. Our reserve balances are solid, but they're not clearly tied strong enough to long-term objectives. Next slide, please. We'll show you some of the key indicators that indicate our financial position. Next slide, please. So this shows you how much we've spent over the last 10 years per home. So we took the expenditures of the municipality, we divided them into the number of homes we've had each year and we adjusted them for inflation. When that happens, you can see that that light blue bar chart has been very consistent over time. It has almost not changed at all. Matter of fact, I think it's it's dropped a little tiny bit there. The dark blue chart is actually provincial expenditures. Those are the mandatory provincial charges for education, which you know we have been looking into in terms of where our level of responsibility is for those items. Uh, next chart, please. Excuse me, Bruce. Uh, yes. Pardon me, Bruce. We've we've gotten ahead one slide. Uh, we were looking at slide seven. Thank you. So this is uh, the expenditure per dwelling that you were just speaking about with uh, provincial and municipal expenditures. So now we'll be moving on to debt on slide seven. My apologies. I was, was clicking between, 
I'm flicking between screens trying to uh, trying to keep track. This uh, next slide shows you the average tax per single family home. So in this particular slide uh, is done. The data for this comes from the city of Calgary, who runs a benchmark study on taxes across the country. You can see to the far left, Halifax is the third lowest amongst these cities. Not all Canadian cities are here, but we do benchmark in, in the lowest third. This tends to be consistent on most of the benchmark studies that you see out there, that we do benchmark quite low, quite modest in terms of taxes. You'll sometimes see references in the media to quote unquote, the tax rate. Uh, this one actually looks at the tax bill, which is a more accurate way to kind of uh, represent the taxes that are paid. Next slide, please. This slide is on the commercial side. So in the report, you'll see that there are several benchmarks for commercial class A office space, class B office space and industrial office space. These ones uh, come from 2015. We're in the process of updating them, so we expect the new data in soon. So you can see that here we benchmark very much middle of the pack on commercial taxes. 619, uh, we're much lower than some of the major cities across the country. Uh, so we remain relatively competitive compared to, uh, compared to other cities. Next slide, please. This is an important slide. This shows you our debt service costs. Often what we show you when we show you debt is we show you the stock of debt. And in 1997, we had huge debt, which was almost 350 million. And over time, due to our debt policy, we've brought that down quite dramatically. What that also means is that we brought down our debt service costs. And so debt is really about the ability to repay that debt. But the second thing that's often forgotten about debt is that debt allows you to invest in your community. So if your debt is too low, it may mean that you are under investing in your community. This shows you that our debt currently, debt service costs are roughly 4% of our revenues. So we have tremendous ability to actually increase our debt. The provincial guideline on how much uh, you should really have in debt service costs is 15%. Next slide, please. So why do we need a strategy? What is it that we need to do differently? I think it's fair when we look at sustainability to say that our strategies and tools have served us well over the last number of years. We've succeeded at keeping debt low, taxes moderate, and maintaining good reserve balances. That's now changing. We're reaching a changing point, and there's several key reasons for that. First of all, there's been a very strong growth in population and in the economy. Prior to the pandemic, we were one of the fastest growing jurisdictions in the country. So that growth brings significant opportunities for us. It also brings significant challenges because along with that growth comes higher costs for governments and individuals, as well as issues of affordability and inclusion. The second thing that's changed is that we have new major council initiatives, such as the Integrated Mobility Plan, Halifax, Rapid Transit. Those are typical of the expectations that the public wants and, and the direction that the council is wishing to go. But the success of those initiatives is very heavily dependent upon a number of things, including uh, we need to have strong long-term planning, we need robust funding models, we need significant new sources of revenue. Uh, currently, right now, it's not clear to us how we are going to fund those initiatives on a go-forward basis. So keeping that in mind, uh, the public expectations, the major initiatives approved by Council, changes in population and economy, we're somewhat at risk of falling behind in terms of fiscal sustainability. So we need to think about the forward path as opposed to how well we've done in the, in the past. So it's critical to remember that that sustainability does, does not imply either high or low level of funding. Rather, what we need to do is keep our funding and expenses planned out, consciously decided upon, and we need to be able to scale our operations to ensure that sustainability. Next slide, please. 
when you go through the fiscal sustainability strategy, you're going to see a wide variety of changes and in initiatives. Many of those are improvements to existing processes that are ongoing and don't require further council direction. But there are three specific areas that we wish to highlight in our recommendations. First of all, we need much stronger long term financial planning. It needs to encompass operating capital, debt and reserves. It needs and it needs to be tied to many of other our other reports and processes. So what we're suggesting that we have a one year budget, a three year outlook and a longer term generational plan that's tied to council strategic vision. Essentially, we need to know where we are going, what steps we need to take to get there, and we need to focus on it and adjust course so we can be successful. So that is the first thing, strong long term planning. Secondly, taxes remain one of our key stumbling blocks to success. Our fiscal capacity is simply not strong enough to achieve the goals that we have in transportation, the environment and elsewhere simply by staying the course. Some of the gap that we have may be closed by cost sharing from senior levels of government. However, we need to make the best use that we can of our fiscal capacity. One of the items that we would recommend is a tax and revenue strategy so that we can understand the principles behind when, how and how much we tax and when we should use or avoid fees and other revenue ideas and how all of that ties into our competitiveness. So one of the factors that I uh, failed to mention earlier is that we are extremely dependent upon tax revenue. Over 80% of our revenue comes from tax revenues and so that has obvious implications for our fiscal capacity. Uh, another key point related to the tax and revenue strategy is the need to be inclusive and support lower income citizens. So that is the, the second area where we have a recommendation. Thirdly, we need a new project or a new approach to our larger strategic projects. Our budget systems and processes are great at absorbing and adapting for all the changes that we debate each year but they're simply not nimble or strong enough to deal with our large aspirational goals such as transit, the environments and elsewhere. Hence, we're proposing a new concept to fund our large aspirational goals, strategic infrastructure reserves. Next slide, please. So here's how such a reserve would work. It all starts off with the strategic planning process when Council selects its priority areas, outcomes and their strategic initiatives. Most strategic initiatives may not require their own fund. The majority of them will be funded through the ongoing annual budget process or the budget adjustment list and so on. However, the larger strategic initiatives, many of them in infrastructure, those will require a dedicated fund and a tremendous amount of focus. After Council selects strategic initiatives, staff will review them to determine which require their own dedicated funds and what the long term costs are projected to be. They'll look at the capital and the operating costs of those initiatives and they'll make a recommendation from Council to establish a special reserve fund and staff will identify the funding for source, likely a combination of tax increases, additional debt, cost sharing from other levels of government or funds being redirected. There will also be alternatives presented either in funding or in project scope. It's entirely up to Council to accept, reject or modify those recommendations. At each step of that process, Council is in control and can see what the taxpayer is achieving from the proposed fund. As projects grow and change over time, funding can be adjusted up or down. We've given you an example here on the slide of a strategic initiative. So in this case, let's say that we have a strategic initiative which which costs roughly $230 million. Half of the funding comes from cost sharing, which means HRM has to raise the other 115 million on its own. Now, the major cost in this project will take some time to design, potentially tender an award. So in this example, the funds aren't required until year three. However, HRM would start saving for the project today, putting aside almost $10 million in each year. In year three, it would issue $115 million in debt to pay for its share of the costs. Now, $115 million is simply too much to put through our capital budget in one year. In a typical year, we can deliver about $150 million, so $115 million is simply too large. 
that debt would be repaid in year over time in years four through 13. And the funds that are accumulating in the strategic infrastructure reserve would pay for that debt cost. So by the end of year 13, HRM has repaid the 115 million in principal plus the interest cost, which would be roughly 15 million. And at that time, the reserve can be closed and the funds can be readjusted as to wherever council wishes. So in order to raise $9.9 .9 million a year, that would be roughly an additional two cents on the residential and commercial tax rate. These numbers are simply illustrative to show you the concept. We have no preconception as to what the amount of money is required to, uh, <clears throat> in order to do the very strategic infrastructure reserves that will be coming forward. We're really trying to focus right now on the concept. So if you think in terms of something such as like an RRSP or an RESP, this is very similar to that, where you put away money every single year, but you know that that money will be used for a certain critical <coughs> service. In the case of the individuals, it would be used for retirement or education. In the case of council, it would be used for some strategic initiative, whether it be electrification, rapid transit, Halifax, or the like. So today we are simply asking for direction to bring such proposals forward. Council agrees in January, then they'll see a series of proposals for new funds that they can then review. Next slide, please. In addition to those main recommendations, we have identified a lengthy series of actions and changes that need to be made. Many of those do not require additional council direction. So, but we would like to highlight the follow. Service-based budgeting, that should be a goal for HRM. In simple terms, this means that we wouldn't be budgeting so much by department, but by program or service. This will help us to understand the outcomes for our tax dollars and how our taxes affect service levels. Uh, in order to proceed in a system like this, we need to replace our current financial systems. Uh, that's currently underway and we expect the new systems to be fully operational by 23-24. So that is essentially when we would expect this project to start. We also need to seek uh, new financing opportunities outside of the Nova Scotia Municipal Finance Corporation. We'd like to look at the FCM Green Fund, the Canada Infrastructure Bank. This will require approval from the provincial government, either through amendments to the charter or a broadening of of provincial legislation. And we are planning on doing additional work on settlement patterns. These are an important influence on costs. We know that as we grow and development patterns change, this affects how efficient we are in terms of providing services, the ease and the cost. We've done considerable research on that through the regional plan, but there's more to learn and to understand and to be updated. Next slide, please. As we grow, as Halifax grow, it needs to find new and better ways to fund its aspirations. The policies and approaches that have worked so well for us in the past are unlikely to work as well in the future. Large transformational initiatives need to be carefully planned out in advance, but to proceed, their funding needs to be very nimble and upfront. So as we grow in size, expectations are becoming more and more pronounced. If we wish to be successfully moving forward as a leader in a municipality, we need to advance our strategies and our financial policies to the next level. So therefore, Council, in closing, the recommendations are as follows. Uh, that is that the Budget Committee direct the CAO to develop strategic initiative reserves as part of its budget. Uh, the key elements of there is that they these funds are, need to be significant enough to lead to a discernible increase in the tax rate or special funding outside the normal budget process. Uh, secondly, that starting with the 21-22 budget and replacing the two-year detailed budget, we should develop a long-term financial plan focused on sustainability that includes a one-year budget, a three-year outlook, and a long-term plan based on council strategic vision. And thirdly, for the 22-23 budget, we should provide a tax and fee revenue strategy to the budget committee, establishing guiding principles for user fees and property taxes. Council, that is our presentation. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fisher. Can we move to the next slide, please?
Thank you. So we have the recommendation from um, from the finance department, and I'm wondering if uh, we could have someone put this on the floor so that we could start discussion, please. Uh, Councillor Outfit, uh, you were the first to speak, so would you like to put this on the floor? Okay, uh, I'm going to uh, put this on the floor and then I do have some questions. It's recommended that the Budget Committee direct the CAO to one, develop strategic initiative reserves as part of the 2021-22 budget process for projects that are tied to an improved council strategy and are uh, significant enough to lead to a discernible increase yeah, uh, in uh, increase in the tax rate or special funding that is outside of the normal budget process. This should include any required changes to debt and reserve policies and should be eligible to be funded through de dedicated tax levies. Two, starting with the 2021-22 budget and replacing the two-year uh, detailed budget, develop a long-term financial plan focused on sustainability that includes a one-year budget, a three-year outlook, a long uh, term plan based on council's strategic vision that supports the operating capital and reserve budgets and allows the municipality to meet its long-term goals. And three, for the 2022-23 budget, provide a tax and fee revenue strategy to budget committee that will establish guiding principles for user fees and property taxes. So move. Second, Lisa. Okay, thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the presentation, Bruce and uh, and Jane. Just a, a couple of uh, questions, and then a, and a comment. The question is, and Bruce, you and I have this dance every year when it comes to uh, to tax uh, bills, comparing us to other cities, because I do represent a. a a district, as you know, and you live in it, that has all kinds of new construction and people moving in here from all over the country who tell us that when their housing prices come down when they move here, that their taxes go up significantly. So the chart that is used, I believe that you said created by the city of Calgary, does that include the 30% roughly, the 29 or 30% on each tax bill that comes from us that is actually used by us? We are collecting money for the province. So in other words, if I if my tax bill, let's say, is two thousand dollars, and we know that seventeen hundred or fifteen hundred or whatever of it is being used uh, by HRM and the rest being used by the province, does that statistic, which stat is that chart using when it says our taxes are comparatively so low compared to those other cities? So that's question number one regarding whether that twenty nine or thirty percent that goes to the province is included. My second question is. Uh, when you're talking about the strategic uh, initiative fund uh, and we'll have to decide a if we want that and what the contribution would be, how is that going to be different and what's going to happen to the strategic capital reserve fund that we already have, which does serve some of this purpose, different source of revenue uh, for it, so to speak. It's not an, in, it's not a separate revenue stream. It's like any other reserve that sounds funny, but how is that going to be different and how are they going to be used differently? So that's question number two. My comment is, and you, you touched on this in your uh, presentation, and I think that it's particularly of importance to districts 13, 14, 15, 16, and one, I would argue, in my opinion, that the increased demand from growth is putting pressure on services and infrastructure and facilities. And I think that's true, yet the previous council gave direction, rightly or wrongly so, that 70 to 80 percent of capital be used for a uh, state of good repair of existing infrastructure services and, and uh, facilities. So I'm wondering, and we're not bound by that decision, of course, should we want to discuss it uh, or read us uh, re, uh, have a rediscussion? I'm just wondering, are we not, with the significant growth that we have, which is good, and we didn't highlight enough, I don't think in the presentation, that this growth also is a great source of revenue. There were times during my time on council, in fact, three times when we didn't have to raise the tax bills because we actually lived off the increased revenue from growth and also the uh, the detransfer tax. So I just want a little bit more discussion, if I could, on are we doing enough to address the costs associated with the growth, but also 
the benefit of this revenue from the growth. So we need to have a discussion on that as well as my two questions, which if you wouldn't mind, and thank you. Uh, yes, so the first question I, I believe was on the benchmarking of taxes. Yeah. The benchmarks that we've shown you include all of the provincial mandatory costs. So, so they essentially show the average single family home. Within okay. that average, there are highs and lows and there are variations. Uh, I think the comment that you're probably referring to is when someone moves from a different jurisdiction and let's say they move from a jurisdiction with very high property prices and they're coming to our jurisdiction, which has modest property prices. So they're buying a lower priced home and yet they see their taxes rise. Uh, so what essentially is happening there is let's say you live in a certain other city, let's just say Vancouver, for example, you might own the average property price might be a million dollars. That might be the 50% level. So you leave Vancouver with your property that is basically an average Vancouver property and you move here and you buy a $600,000 property, which is very much towards the top end of the market. You're now at the top end of the property tax bills. So uh, I think it, it does cause a little bit of confusion for people because the average property prices differ so dramatically across the country. Uh, your second question was the comparison. We do have a strategic reserve, a strategic capital reserve, and we've had different strategic reserves over the years. So our strategic capital reserve is, is really designed to deal with opportunities. So it's designed to deal with like unspecified infrastructure opportunities that arise through the capital budget and so on. It's got some good funding in it, but it doesn't have huge dedicated funding. So the difference I think is one of scale. We need much more funding in order to deal with the very larger aspirational projects, and it needs to be dedicated towards a, a single or sole major initiative. So that's the difference there. Uh, your third question, I think, was was a really good question. So that that determines the cost of growth. So we do get, of course, tax revenues are growing over time and so are the costs. So we've seen significant costs to simply maintain both our asset bases and our operational services. Uh, the de-transfer tax has given us some good sources of revenue but it tends to be uh, a little bit unpredictable over time. It doesn't have a strong trend line, so we can't always always budget for it. When we look forward to January to coming back with strategic infrastructure initiative reserves, we'll build in as much as we can from the existing growth as is possible. Oh, OK, and thank you. And just uh, quickly, Mr. Chair, I just uh, want to Tim, if I, if I could, it's uh, you're a little bit over time, so okay, I didn't get an answer to my question there, there, though. But when we would discuss the sorry, Chair, but just very quickly, the 70 or 80 percent decision that we made to go for state of good repair versus new the need, the need for some of these new facilities and infrastructure. When did we when do we do reevaluate that if we wish to? Uh, Mr. Chair, so that would be part of, through you to, to the committee, to the Deputy Mayor, that would be part of the capital conversation. What we're talking about here uh, with the strategic initiatives is really over what our base allocation would be. Um, the risk is by not investing in our existing asset base is that it's a further deterioration and we are seeing that in street recapitalization with the current plan that we have. What happens is um, because of the desire to advance IMP initiatives through multimodal uh, corridors, what's happening is that we are eroding the funding that goes into street recap um, in order to advance complete streets. So it really is a full picture of being able to look at what is what is based what is it that we should be doing on an annual basis to maintain the, the $3.8 billion worth of assets that we have? And then as well, layering on in a very deliberate, strategic way to advance those initiatives and then reporting back on how we're doing it. Understood. All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. And, uh, and uh, OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mason. Uh, there, can you hear me? There we go. Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, staff. I want to acknowledge the incredible hard work uh, to get to a point where we have we are discussing a policy uh, around 
you know, it's the equivalent of incorporating operating cost of capital, but it's the strategic cost of strategic ambition, right? Like we, when I, what I'm trying to get to is when I got elected in 2012, one of the biggest things in that election was that the city was perceived to make plans and have no actual ability to execute them in terms of money or staff. So for us to actually really dig into what is it going to cost to do these aspirational things and, and own that is part of the change I think we've seen in the last eight years in the, in, in, in the way we approach things. And I, I absolutely support that. The tax rate uh, is something that uh, obviously concerns everybody, but if we are going to introduce new and improved services, that's got to be paid for. And and so I think it's good that we own those things uh, and, and the impact that uh, our aspirations could have on that tax rate, which I frankly think based on the modeling, what little modeling has been done to date is actually pretty modest given the scale of our ambitions. Uh, the uh, I want to second what uh, Deputy Mayor Outhead said, which is, uh, uh, you know, I you know, Jane, that I'm a big nerd about stuff and I'm so excited. I'm still excited, even though it's been six years that like someday we're going to, I know it's not actually the, anywhere near this easy, press a button and Enterprise Asset Management and Fleet HQ will pick, will kick out a number that says, this is what you should be paying to maintain all your stuff. Because I know we don't know that, but but you just use that three point eight billion dollar figure, and and we know that if we uh, if we uh, just did a basic uh, one point four or point four or point two uh, of that, you know, a percentage two percent or four percent of that as a as the baseline, you'd start to be getting into numbers that dwarf what we currently spend on capital. So so it doesn't take a lot of analysis to know we're not spending enough to maintain our asset base, and and we need to come to grips with that, and that will also have tax implications. Uh, I, I will uh, close by saying uh, that the, uh, uh, you know, we had a discussion around transit tax. I heard you talk about that, Bruce, early in the discussion. Uh, the, the few councillors who were around at that point may recall, I believe it was right after the election in 2016, we had a discussion about changing the scope of the regional uh, uh, transportation tax, which right now you know, I would love to see us move toward transit being fully funded, cap and operating from a tax rate, uh, transferring points from general operating to that, uh, having a long term budget, uh, making it so that the rural areas, unless you're within five kilometers of a Metro X or a kilometer of a stop, you don't pay anything. Uh, and the reason I think we need to do that is that there is uh, the the 2009 adoption of a regional transit tax or transportation tax is a holdover from before the regional plan put a hard boundary for urban services uh, for transit. And so so I think there there is an expectation that someday transit service may go to those areas and, and uh, based on the fact that they're paying a small amount of money toward it, a third of what someone who's receiving the service does. But then, you know, the, the regional plan doesn't say that it says that they'll be uh, they'll, they'll receive service through other means uh, like the, the rural transit initiatives. So I think we really need to look at that. We need to have really clear rate structures around that. And, and I think that we need to know the real cost of transit. So when we extend transit, that real cost is something that the people who are now getting transit they didn't get are going to see come on the tax bill. Uh, I've been talking for years about taking on more debt for these strategic projects doesn't scare me at all. Glad to see that that's a potential uh, thing that we're talking about. And I love the idea of a strategic initiative fund so we can clearly show our public uh, what uh, these ambitions are going to cost. So overall, very pleased with this uh, and, uh, you know, very excited to bring this forward and I will be supporting the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Muted, Paul. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mason. Um, Ms. Fraser, Mr. Fisher, any response? Oh, no, okay. thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I would like to echo Councillor Mason's comments about um, the amount of work that's gone in here and, and how exciting it is to kind of see a strategic plan for our finances tied to our outcomes and our deliverables and our goals. Um, you know, obviously that is where we need to go next. Uh, you know, a question around that is, um, you know, because we have, all, you know, we've been doing things in a siloed fashion, particularly around the business units and, you know, this change of from 
funding around business units to services delivered. I mean, that to me seems like a huge change. So I'd be really interested in any comments or thoughts on how as an organization HRM intends to um, change to be able to have that service focused um, deliverable rather than the business unit in terms of budgeting and financing. Um, I also have a question about um, the average tax per single family home. And in that comparison chart with other cities, I'm just wondering how many other cities have on that chart have an assessment cap like we do. And while you know we're looking at this from a regional municipality perspective and we kind of get that nice average figure, um, the reality is that we have some people paying above that and some people paying below that um, kind of created by this you know, artificially by this cap that's in place. And I think it's just important to have some transparency and some discussion around that and how that might um, affect individual households versus looking at, you know, the municipality as a whole. And, and that gets to some of what I believe uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Elhit was talking about. And, um, you know, I too think that it's amazing to see that our debt to service costs are, are so low and that perhaps now is a time to be looking at some investment, um, particularly in infrastructure and protecting our open spaces and in our land use policy, because those are the things that can really kind of shape our growth and in particular find those cost efficiencies. I was a little taken aback by one line in the financial strategy report that along with growth comes higher cost to government and individuals as well as issues around affordability, accessibility and inclusion. Um, you know, there's smart growth and then there's just growth growth. And I think that we can't just expect to keep growing and seeing escalating costs with no efficiencies or benefits. So one of the key things I think we need to find is the alignment and the efficiencies between all of our strategic initiatives. I mean, you know, if we cost them individually, um, you know, in, we can't continue to cost them individually in silos. If you look at a lot of those strategic initiatives, they reference other strategic initiatives. So in language, they're all being kind of intertwined and networked together. But what does that mean in terms of a cost deliverable and setting priorities that meet several strategic initiatives? I think we really have to work hard to find out, find those cost efficiencies. We can't just keep growing, um, you know, growing and increasing costs that doesn't seem to me to be sustainable for individual home homeowners individual you know individuals in our city um, and a question about the dedicated tax levies and i'm wondering because we are a regional municipality we have an urban suburban and rural components each with different characteristics each with different needs and in applying those tax levies, um, has there been any thought about how that might differ across the municipality or, you know, um, either in the levy itself or in how those levies get applied to specific um, initiatives related to those different areas? Um, all right, I think, uh, I think I got it all in there. I, I'm sorry, I'm trying to squeeze everything into my five minutes. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chair. So I'll, I'll, kick, I'll kick off and then Bruce can fill in some of the blanks. Um, so on service on service based budgeting, that is a huge change. It's a huge cultural change um, for the organization and for any organization, not just HRM. Um, one of the tools that we need in order to be able to do that is really the business transformation that we're going through with SAP. So that is a, a complete uh, transformation of our financial system as well as HR system, which will then allow us to, to mine the data through business intelligence um, to be able to do those analytics. So currently uh, in finance, we do have a pilot project with two business units to get an idea of the type of information that we have to gather for, for service costs and, and to look at it that way. So, so that preliminary work is, is underway. Um, I would estimate that that is probably a four, four year project and it wouldn't be a flip of a switch. It would be more of gathering the information and reporting on it and then the migration over towards that. 
um, in order to, the most important thing is is understanding what the co uh, the services cost and then communicating that back out to, to the public. On the, um, the assessment, um, I believe there's a couple of things in assessment that's unique in Nova Scotia that impact um, uh, our ability to, to generate tax revenue. One is the cap, and I do believe that we are the only ones in the country that do have an assessment cap. The other thing is, is that we're one of the only few jurisdictions that actually does an annual assessment role, which means that our, our assessment base gets refreshed every year. So we're gathering that that growth um, on an annual basis as opposed to having to wait for, um, you know, three years and it's based on market. So there's a lot of variations across the country on on assessment. Um, you know, your comments about uh, smart growth. Absolutely, um, you know, and certainly uh, aligning with the regional plan and, and other plan policy to understand where that growth is occurring and, and being forward thinking um, about where we're going to need to, to site services. So if we know that there's going to be development somewhere, should we be looking now for land for fire stations, for park and amenities and those sorts of things? Very much looking at all that and then harmonizing the initiatives because you're exactly right. They are not mutually exclusive, they build on them. We see that very much with IMP, um, Halifax, and then uh, rapid transit all uh, building in, in there. Um, on the dedicated tax levy, um, what we're thinking is that it would be um, a flat amount on the, on the existing rates. So whatever the uh, urban suburban rural rate is would be adding that, but that is part of the work that needs to be done. Um, I think by looking at the other tax areas such as transit tax, that allows the people that are benefiting from the service um, to, to pay for that, that service. So that's all part of the um, review of, of tax revenue. Um, and Bruce can certainly speak to, to the tax side of things and tax policy. Um, much more intelligently than, than I can. Bruce, do you have anything to fill in? I, I think you've covered pretty much everything on the assessment crap. You're, you're bang on. Even without the assessment cap, there are large variations in the uh, average tax bill, especially for new homeowners. New homeowners typically have higher tax bills than do long established homeowners, largely because of the cap, but also because the costing is much easier to do. Uh, the new homes tend to be a little bit more valuable than existing stock, all those reasons. We can provide information for council on that, you know, some of those variations. We typically do that during budget presentations. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there's nothing else, uh, Ms. Fraser or Mr. Fisher, uh, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, staff, for the presentation to kick off budget season. This is uh, this is such a nicer way to begin the process rather than uh, starting to argue over. Uh, well, is it 1.5? Is it two? Is it one? Uh, to, ha to to start from this point and actually put that discussion for when the assessment poll comes in. So uh, I I'm liking our start this year. Um, I, I like where we're where we're suggesting on going. Particularly, I mean, whenever we talk about revenue, I mean, it's it, 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 it all it all it's all very political. And one of the things that I personally I really have issue with in politics is when politics takes the place of good government. Um, the, anyone who tells you you can have more service without taking on debt or raising any more money isn't pledging good government. That's just fantasy land. Um, and thankfully at City Hall, uh, we don't, we, we have not a whole lot of that for the most part. I think we keep our, keep ourselves pretty rooted to the ground. And I see what we're doing here is very much in fitting with that sort of approach. Um, but I think what I sense from where we're going on this is when we're talking integrated mobility, when we're talking climate change plan, um, having a very clear plan to be able to say to people, well, this is what we're going to be spending your money on. This is why it's important. Um, I mean, I think this is a wonderful approach towards um, being transparent and accountable and providing people with a real explanation as to, well, we need to raise your rates uh, because of X or we need to take on more debt because of X or we're going to end up uh, costing you more in the long term 
because we're going to be taking on more debt service payments. Whatever the financial discussion will be, having a principled place of saying, well, this is why we're going to be spending that money, I think is, is a very good thing and something that has been lacking. Um, just briefly, I will say that uh, kudos on the demise of one year budgeting. I think it was a great idea and a great experiment, uh, but really didn't quite pan out. I think everyone around the council table, I mean, we were always revising it. They, they were always changed. I think uh, keeping it to one year um, makes, makes sense based on the kind of proof in the pudding on the ground as to how it's worked out. Uh, I am a little skeptical. Uh, I'll save the discussion for another time because it is kind of outwork. But this idea of business unit versus uh, service based presentations and uh, accounting, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll wait to hear more on that as, as it comes forward. But I'm, uh, I'm a little skeptical as to how that how that might work. Uh, and uh, the last thing I'm going to hit on is that renewal versus uh, growth. I, I I wouldn't want to see us throw that away because one of the things that um, that I think is important is to recognize it, it's never as much it's never as exciting to be spending money on fixing something up. Um, but government uh, all levels face the challenges. It's so much more fun to be cutting the ribbon on something new and shiny than it is to be fixing something up. But if you don't do enough of the fixing, you end up stuck with things like our washroom strategy that just came through council a few weeks ago, where almost all the money has to be spent on the falling down, absolutely terrible condition of the old buildings because the work of renewal was not done along the way. So there is a balance to be had there. And uh, it, 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 if growth is causing more pressure, then we need to look at increasing the revenue, so not robbing from renewal. Because the renewal thing is uh, it might be in the long run. So, uh, on the whole, very pleased with where there's where this is going. The only skepticism I have is on this business unit versus service um, thing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fraser and Mr. Fisher. Any response? No. Okay, uh, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just emailed uh, all members of council plus some of the senior staff of the Entra report. Remember that rural Metro X rural service we're supposed to have? We brought in the tax structure. We brought in the regional transportation tax for it, but never implemented it to its fullest extent. We see it on Highway 101, 102, 103, fully built. 107, one terminal. It deserves four. Where are they? We need to have a people complaining about this tax structure. I'm glad that Councillor Mason is referencing we need to have this tax structure reflect the service. Well, give me the park and ride terminals to reflect that service. Um, you know, he says you should live within five kilometers. Well, I can tell you that the, the tax structure goes out to Oyster Pond, the Sand River Bridge. The closest terminal is 25 kilometers away, not five kilometers, as Councillor Mason uh, suggested. So I think we need to revisit uh, this tax, uh, this tax structure. I, I think the regional uh, transportation tax needs to be transformed into our integrated mobility levy. We want to take sure take, we have a funding mechanism in place to fully implement our integrated mobility plan. That can help pay for the rural transit initiatives, can pay for the Metro X as promised. It can still pay for the ferry terminals. It can still pay for the, the rapid bus service. It also extends into active transportation. You know, opportunity to pave the shoulders of some of our rural roads in cooperation and in, in partnership with the province. We can put it into our recreational trails. We can put it into a rails to trails corridor, and we can put it into all that. It's a part of our integrated mobility strategy. So I'm hoping that we can do that this time. It's um, I don't know if, if staff require a motion to to revisit how we can restructure our budget regards to taking all those integrated mobility components and putting it aside out of the general tax rate or from the urban tax rate or from the suburban tax rate and put it in with the regional transportation tax and, re and reform it and remodulize it to that. So can I have some comment on that, please? Well, I think I sorry, think but, oh, go ahead, Jane. All right. Sorry, Bruce. Um, my mouse was acting up. Uh, so that that really is the intent of the tax reform that that uh, Bruce was speaking about was really looking at that and looking at what the costs are. 
um, and how things are going to be advanced. Um, so that is that is part of the normal work. It will be council's decision on whether or not um, there are tax reforms that are there. I wasn't um, here for the uh, work that you're speaking about, so Bruce can certainly um, add some more uh, to, to the commentary for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Yeah, Thank you very I, I much. I think it's certainly, uh, certainly worth looking at, Councillor. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jane and uh, Bruce and Jacques for the uh, presentation. I like uh, the direction it's going in. Um, kind of share Councillor Austin's, not skepticism, but uh, just wondering about how the service-based budgeting when we get to it is will, will work. The process we've used the last eight years has been a good process, long and laborious and time consuming, but um, as Councillor Mason will know when we came in in 2012 and we moved to this and moved to having the um, budget uh, committee of the whole, I think it's been it's been productive uh, at the end of the day. I'm more inclined to sort of make a few points than to ask questions. And these are points I've made before, and it's for people who may be listening. And that is that there's a number of things in our budgeting that are outside the control of the municipality. Uh, one of them is the assessment. So PVFC will do their uh, annual report. We'll know in January what the in, what the assessment rates are. And for those who still can't figure out property taxes, because it is a little bit like trying to figure out federal equalization, it's really based on the value of a property determined by somebody else and then the tax rate that we um, uh, put on it. So PVFC, that's beyond our control. Uh, so is the provincial component. If you look at the charts that are in the report, it's very clear the provincial um, component of our tax bill has gone up at a much higher rate than the municipal component. Have. We have no control over that. The province tell us and we have to put that on our tax bill as if it's actually money that's coming to us when it's not. Be that as it may. Bruce talked about the fact that we have been a growing city and that's been very true. And I think growing in a generally sustainable uh, way, deliberate uh, way, by and large, uh, certainly with some exceptions. But, um, you know, back in 2012, when I became mayor, everybody agreed that we had to build the downtown up, that it had been neglected, that we had to build up the downtown, protect communities, whole communities outside the core, and protect our green spaces and improve on uh, transit. That's kind of been a bit of a, a guiding star, a star for us. Now, we have held the line on taxes. And um, if you look at cities similar to us um, in Canada, population wise, um, you know, Regina's tax went up last year 3.25, Saskatoon was 3.7, London was 4.4. Um, and we're, we grew faster than any of those cities did. Edmonton went up 2.6, Winnipeg was 2.3, Vancouver was 7, Toronto was 4.2, Mississauga was 3. Point something. So our, our tax increase at 1.4 was not at all. Um, uh, unreasonable. And I would argue that we've held the line somewhat on spending while we have moved much more aggressively into what you might call the social areas that council wasn't really all that interested in doing a number of years ago. Uh, but we have been able to hold the line while doing things on food and on housing and uh, um, social inclusion. You know, it, it's hard to believe in any day and age that if you go back to the time of amalgamation, our debt was 350 million, and today it's 235 or 232 million. There aren't that many governments, certainly in Atlantic Canada, whose debt has actually gone down. So we have a very manageable debt, as Councillor Mason said. You can use that, especially you time to use that. If you look at the charts of our debt, uh, it spiked the last time there was major infrastructure spending, and that's a good time to take advantage of leveraging money. I like where we've been going across departmentally, uh, things like Halifax uh, and the work that was done on environment uh, wasn't done in a silo, it was done with lots of other, uh, with every other department and stakeholders in the uh, community. I was speaking to one yesterday who said they had never been so consulted and involved in um, a government initiative as that. We've been all trying to figure out really for the last number of years with all this growth in the city, where's the dividend? because it hasn't been on commercial taxes. We haven't seen the commercial taxes jump up and that's in due in part to a lot of things. One is the new buildings do pirate some existing clients from others. And so people will move from one building to another. People are taking smaller space than they used to take. That's just the nature of the world. 
whether that continues after COVID, sharing spaces or not, we'll, we will find out. But where we have seen that dividend of growth, uh, and I briefs I would ask you perhaps, is in the deed transfer tax. We have consistently seen our deed transfer revenue higher. It paid for a number of the issues, a number of the items that we, we kept after the recast. It came out of our deed transfer last year, which was 20 or some million dollars above uh, um, schedule. So I guess that's my rant. I don't necessarily need an answer. Bruce, you can just nod if you think I'm right or Jane. Um, but that's the that's the dividend of our growth. We need to continue to grow in a sustainable and just way. And I think that the measures I see in front of us will help us to uh, to do that. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm wondering if we can get something a little more than a nod. <laughs> well, I, I think yeah. you know you're, you're. Go ahead, Jane. No, go, Bruce. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you're right in the tax. We're all kind of looking for the dividend. We have not seen rapid growth in commercial that really compares to the rapid growth in the economy and, and the city and the population. It just hasn't happened. And I think the message is that a lot of that commercial seems to lag a lot and there's a lot of offsetting factors that have slowed it. Where we have seen some of that growth is in the deed transfer tax, which seems to have bumped up very, very quickly, but then of course after the recast it bumped down. And so it's it's difficult to plan around that D transfer tax, unfortunately, but it's a, it's a great thing for us to have. And really that's it for our revenues. Those are really our sources. Property tax is 80%. D transfers has given us some, some very nice sums of money, but it's hard to do long-term plans and initiatives around the expectation that it will stay there. Jane, did you want to add? The only thing that I would add to that is that the um, the apartments, so multi-unit uh, construction that that we see, they're actually taxed as residential. So some of that big growth that we do see is coming from the apartments that be that are being built, as opposed to on the commercial side. Okay, super. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and uh, Bruce, Jane, Jacques. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, this presentation. Uh, I uh, agree with uh, Councillor Austin that this is uh, a much better way to uh, to kick things uh, off, and uh, appreciate that immensely. And uh, I just have a question, and uh, you know, I think uh, Councillor Cuddle uh, nailed it when she said this is uh, moving from a business unit budgeting format to a service based budgeting format is going to be that's a that's a that's a huge workload right there and uh, I think uh, communication really is going to be key when it comes to that so uh, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how that evolves but uh, my, my question about moving from a business unit budgeting uh, format to service based I'm just wondering what experience if any that the team has in uh, that sort of transformational budgeting. And if you've seen this type of transition, if there are other examples in Canada where you've seen municipalities go from department-based to service-based. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to, uh, to the, the committee. So um, Calgary actually does service-based budgeting. So there are examples of other municipalities that, that have done that and, and ones that would be similar to, to our size and experience. Uh, we do not have um, experience currently with that. And some of that for that reason is because our systems uh, where we would actually harvest the information is they're just not robust. Um, so once we have the ability to, to mine that data, we will be able to, to um, gather that information and essentially what it is, it's just when, when people say, how much does it cost to deliver transportation? We then bring in all of the areas that are delivering transportation. So for example, um, planning and development with their transportation uh, planning group, that would go in. You would have TPW, of course, you may have transit. So there's a number of uh, different business units that deliver a component of a service. So it's really about the harmonization of that and the ability to, to communicate um, what it is. It will be and a long- that's, Yeah, and that's exactly what I'm thinking, that the communication is going to be absolutely paramount in this. Exactly. It will oh, be a perfect. long process. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> appreciate it, but I like the direction we're going in. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Daigle-Gammon. 
and you're on mute. Can you hear me now? We can. Thank you. Uh, seems to be working backwards when I think the mic is on, it's off, and when it's off, it's on. Um, so thank you for the presentation, really appreciate it. Um, I guess I'm a little concerned as well, just around the transfer from business unit to service. And I would think that it's probably not something, if I understand this correctly, that we'll see for a couple of years because it will take some time to transition. Um, so we'll have some experience as a counselor with the business unit process to be able to then move to service. One of the things um, around the assessment right, suburban, urban and rural, and one of the comments that was made around um, those benefiting, benefiting from the service get the pay. So my conversation almost goes to what Councillor Hensby was talking about in that we have parts of HRM that don't have service or don't have adequate service. So things like people that still need water, people that need road work, people that need infrastructure, recreation facilities, all of those kinds of things. Does that, in terms of when you, when you transfer, does that conversation lose balance or does it come more into balance, do you think, moving from business unit to a service model? Um, there is always a great disconnect, I believe, in residents about what our tax dollars actually pay for and do you, is it equitable uh, across the, the three sections, urban, rural and suburban? Um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to work through and learn with this process and make sure that uh, as well as we have this new growth, growth and development and people can build smarter because they're building new, but also um, making sure that we take care of what exists and that there is the right level of service um, across HRM. And I'll be interested to read the report that David spoke about. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, through you to, to the committee. So I think, um, you know, for me, it's, it's transparency and accountability in, in our taxation and our service delivery. So, so moving to service-based budgeting, I think it does that. I think it's, um, you know, it's very similar to, I believe it might have been Councillor Austin that said, um, you know, by having strategic initiative funding, we can then report back to the public on where their where their money's going. So it's 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 about when we increase a a, a tax or or make a, a move, it's about being able to to tie that back. So by focusing on service-based budgeting, people know um, what it is that that they're receiving, in my opinion. Bruce, do you have anything else to add on on taxation and the equitableness of it? Bruce You're on muted. mute, Bruce. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I think that's a great communication exercise. Oftentimes people feel that they don't actually get a service. There aren't many services that we deliver directly to the door per se. We'll pick up garbage at your property, but there's a lot of services that people can access or they can benefit to. And there's a degree of access and there's a degree of benefit. It makes it a very challenging to decide who gets different levels of services, especially if you don't have a service-based budgeting or service-based system. So uh, these are these are great discussions. Uh, people do tend to commute around the municipality and use all kinds of services in their daily activities at places other than their home. So we're always trying to kind of square that circle for them. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you to uh, Ms. Fraser, Mr. Fisher, all your staff, the CAO, everyone who's uh, bringing this forward. Um, I, I wholeheartedly support it. I agree entirely. The direction we need to go in. I just want to, based on some of the, the comments that have been made, I just want to make sure that you know we're not we're not being myopic in terms of who benefits and who pays for certain services. Uh, and I want to make sure we're thinking very broadly about this. And Mr. Fisher's last comment uh, was heartening. Because when you think about something like transit, as an example, um, you don't have to ride transit in order to benefit from transit. If you're a rural commuter, and you're driving in your F-150 downtown, you benefit because more people who take transit frees up more road space. So you're benefiting from more people taking transit uh, by being far away from transit as well. And 
you know, uh, the more people we get on transit, the more we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, the more we remove, remove pollutants from the environment, and especially as we electrify in strategic projects like electrifying the bus fleet will we'll reduce those pollutants and greenhouse gases even more. And everyone in HR benefits from that. From a commercial point of view, if I'm an employer, I benefit from more people taking transit. My employees come to work on transit. I can free up some of my own uh, private land because I don't have to provide as much parking. So I want to make sure that we're thinking about benefits and who pays for things that we're actually thinking very broadly about what all the benefits of all of our services are. And as Mr. Fisher said, not all of them are delivered to a door. Another great example is libraries. And not everyone in the municipality goes to a library, but we all benefit from having a safe, accessible space for all types of folks within HRM, from having community gathering venues, from having a literate and engaged uh, uh, citizenry. So those are just my, my points and cautions. I really wholeheartedly support the direction we're going in. This discussion is something that I've been uh, you know, fantasizing about for the last four years. And as we've been moving towards this way, um, you know, it's, it's given me a lot of hope that, you know, the kind of growth and people like uh, Councillor Cuddle and Councillor Mason and others have spoken about smart growth. And absolutely, this brings that into focus. How do we better align? And I can't think of a better time when we are doing the regional plan uh, review right now. We are you know, almost uh, getting to the end of the center plan, looking at suburban uh, development plans uh, and putting tax reform at the center of all that to make sure we're aligning all of the different priorities of council and of municipalities. So kudos to you guys. I think this is fantastic. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, staff, for this presentation. It seems incredibly sensible to be doing multi-year budgeting and, and planning ahead in this way. I don't, I don't, I can't compare with what was done in the past, but it, it seems like a very logical way to go. I just wanted to go back to um, just a question regarding um, a comment a few minutes ago about uh, apartment buildings and that sort of thing. Um, it, it will save the city a lot of money if we get denser and we don't have to build pipes further and further out of the city. We don't have to run such long transit lines and that sort of thing. So the question of density, I think, is really critical for the city in terms of saving money. But as one of, uh, as, since I represent one of the areas that is going to be getting denser quickly, <laughs> I'm very concerned with quality of life issues and also how we raise enough money to spend uh, on infrastructure that will uh, ensure that people benefit from the growth uh, widely. So for example, there's a project in my area that will add a thousand people um, overnight when the door is open, when the apartment opens, a thousand people will be um, moving into the neighborhood. And will there be um, adequate uh, services uh, in terms of green space, the library, the schools um, for a sudden influx of a thousand or more people. Um, so, so this question of density um, is on my mind a lot and I'm just wondering how we will, will we be um, raising enough money from the apartments which are going to be where the, the bulk of people are going to be living in order to um, invest in communities. Do you want to take that one, Bruce? Yes, uh, yes, I will take that one. So, so typically we don't dedicate funds from a particular community or a, a, a group of taxpayers, apartments or commercial towards a different source. So your question really goes to the heart of sustainability. Are we getting enough money off of growth to actually fund those services? Uh, we have in the past, but it is uh, a constant ongoing challenge because we do face uh, pressures both in terms of all those new homes that come along, plus the higher prices for all of the things that we're already providing, whether they be whether they be labor costs, whether they be environmental regulations or all those sorts of things. So that is that is the challenge of budgeting and moving forward and being sustainable, trying to make sure that, you know, we can match and get enough money off of growth to actually keep herself sustainable. Uh, I'm not sure that that gives you the specific answer on your upcoming apartment. But that is the way that we look at it, trying to trying to be sustainable. 
And Ms. Fraser, I wasn't sure if you would like to add something. OK, thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, to staff for this great presentation. Um, as a new councillor, uh, this is very informative and helpful. Um, you know, I, I am in complete agreement that service based budgeting does lead to an increase in transparency. Uh, residents, businesses, uh, you know, they deserve to understand the actual cost of business um, and uh, the actual cost of service. Um, obviously, with an increase, uh, you know, level of transparency uh, that actually can only occur with an increased level of communication and having a strong communication framework that will assist residents to fully understand uh, the impact and the implications uh, of that cost of business and, of course, uh, the increased uh, requests that we have here in my district, uh, District 13. Um, you know, we don't have uh, the transit service to be able to build uh, the commercial tax base. We don't have um, the transit service that can bring those employees uh, to those place of businesses. Um, that, of course, increases um, uh, the challenges and decreases the value of doing business in a place such as District 13. So, you know, we need to consider um, new and innovative ways of building that commercial tax base because, uh, as the mayor has uh, alluded to, certainly building the downtown has been a priority over the past number of years. And what we've done, I think, is neglected the great potential of the tourism value that we have uh, in St. Margaret's Bay. Um, certainly, the iconic Peggy's Cove Lighthouse is the most uh, photographed lighthouse and visited lighthouse across Canada. Um, we have uh, wonderful opportunities uh, in Hubbard's and all along St. Margaret's Bay and Peggy's Cove Road, um, and certainly uh, along Prospect Road as well to increase the commercial businesses um, and increase tourism value. Um, and so I do wonder uh, what opportunities we have to um, revise that tax structure and to consider, uh, uh, you know, ability for um, generating uh, more uh, commercial uh, tax base in those areas. I'm just wondering if there's uh, any comments that you have on that. Thank you. First, you want to take that one? Yeah, so in the in the commercial commercial taxes operate a little bit better, a little bit differently than residential. So this is probably a good time to highlight it. The commercial taxes are significantly higher than are the residential. They're about 2.7 times higher in the urban and suburban areas. Uh, in the rural areas, they actually are not quite as high. So they're still they're, so they're still much lower in in rural HRM, which would encompass out towards the Hubbard's area and uh, and on the eastern shore of Muscadabit Valley. So in terms of growing that commercial tax base or any tax base, that is the absolute challenge. How do you actually grow the tax base? Or how do you actually get more properties in there and more value in there? We're living in an economy where people don't always need bricks and mortar in order to generate income and funds, and that makes it an even greater challenge. So. Uh, uh, that is uh, that is the question that we face on a go forward basis. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we are at the end of the list of speakers. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to make a comment? Uh, go ahead, Councillor Cuddle. Here we go. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I just, uh, you know, just bouncing off that last comment there, um, and I think it was Councillor Cleary who spoke about, you know, how exciting it is to be doing this in the time of the regional plan, um, just showing how important this regional plan is to looking at growing our tax base, looking at growing our economic development, looking at finding cost efficiencies in our servicing and infrastructure. Um, delivery. Um, I just, I, I had one question and, and in this strategic report, there wasn't a slide of, of um, the, our actual revenue from taxes and how that's changed year over year. And I'm wondering when that might be presented just so that we have a, a broader context around um, how our revenue is growing from 
the addition of apartments and new housing and you know the growth that's happening in our municipality um, and the need for increasing taxes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So through you to the committee, you'll see that as part of the fiscal framework. Uh, so Bruce and I will be back on January the 12th to do the fiscal framework. And at that time, that's really where we set um, the table for, for the next four years going forward. So it will be looking at um, past trends in revenue growth. Uh, we break it out by commercial residential. Uh, we do have a graph on apartments, so we can certainly put that in, talk about deed, and then the way that we're going to go be going forward. Um, so it'll be a few full review. Uh, and at that time, we also um, seek direction on um, what the rate should be. So we will have all of the assessment information uh, for the 21-22 fiscal year at that time, and we'll be able to um, to go into great depth then. That's great. And and will there be projections around, you know, things like the impact of COVID um, and all of that? OK, and one and one final comment. And, you know, this really has to do back to the regional plan and back to how we manage our our land use and our infrastructure investments and, um, you know, protecting our open spaces is is really, you know, we are growing up. Um, as a city, we have invested in the downtown, which was much needed over the last decade. But as we move forward into the next 10 years, I, I, I really think that we need to kind of broaden our perspective on, on how we make the city function as a whole, um, including that investment in those outlying communities, which we haven't seen a lot of, you know, at least not here in Spryfield. Um, and um, and in District 11, um, yet we, we are so close to the city and really pay a pivotal role, as do many communities outside of, um, outside of the urban core. And so I think unless we make the entire municipality function, none of it will function as efficiently as it can. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how, again, back to our strategic initiatives and how all of those integrate. All right, thank you so much. It was a great report. I, I really appreciate the work that went into it. Thank you. And thank you very much. I, I do wish to uh, echo many of the comments of, of my colleagues. It has been a fantastic report and it's good to uh, consider that we're going to service-based budgeting instead of department-based budgeting. Um, when people are paying taxes, they are much more looking to see the services that they will get uh, from those taxes instead of the departments that they will support from those taxes. And, and it'll be easier for uh, for communication and for uh, understanding of, of this very complex budget process that we have. So I, I do appreciate uh, that change uh, greatly. Um, we have no further speakers. Um, so I believe we are on to moving on to the uh, the vote on the motion. Uh, so, Mr. Clerk, over to you. So last meeting we voted on this, we just did a show of hands rather than a roll call. Uh, I'm at the pleasure of council, whichever they would prefer to do for that. Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Cleary, our yes, uh, administrative order was updated so that our budget committee of the whole votes would be recorded. Um, I just uh, looked to direction from the um, our solicitor to confirm that. I believe that is correct. I believe that was a motion that was made a while ago. I'm not sure the rule was it was uh, sorry the rules were updated to reflect that, but I do recall that motion. Yeah, that's what it says in AO1. Um, we can just do the roll call if that would be easier. Last time we there was nobody against, so we just recorded that way. But if it's easier, we can just do roll call. So I can start at District 1 with Councillor Daigle Gammon. District 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. District 3, Councillor Kent. I'm in favor. Or account for thirty. District five, Councillor Austin. In favor. District six, Councillor Mancini.
Councillor Mancini. So Councillor Mancini was having uh, mic problems earlier. It, uh, he indicates that he's in favor. District 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. District 8, Councillor Smith. For the motion. District 9, Councillor Cleary. Yes. District 10, Councillor Morse. In favor of the motion. District 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. District 12, Councillor Stoddard. Councillor Stoddard, was that a yes? Sorry, I didn't hear. In favor of the motion. District 13. District 13, Voting Councillor yes. Lovelace. Voting yes. District, District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. District 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. District 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Voting yes. And Mayor Savage. In favor. Super. That Thank cares. you. So that motion passes. Um, we have our next budget meeting on January 13th, but we are following uh, either immediately after this or after lunch. That's up to the mayor uh, with the council meeting. Um, and so with that, I would look for a motion to adjourn. Councilor Cleary. I so move. Super. Thank you, Councilor Cleary. We are adjourned. Uh, so it is one. Ian. So I think it, folks, I think what we'll do, we'll adjourn right to regional council, Mr. Clerk, if that's okay. Can we? We, that's don't, change, we don't need to change screens or anything. Do we need to wait any any amount of time? We've got a bit bit of time before lunch. And so, just a reminder to please join the one o'clock meeting invite for the regional council meeting. So right now, be, this one will be the one o'clock. No, nope, you can wait until one o'clock, but just the, nope. make sure you join the correct one o'clock meeting. Okay. Right now, we're going to go to the one o'clock meeting again, correct? Uh, if so, sorry, the intention is to take a break until one o'clock or to go into it right now? No, I want to go right into council. So then you can stay in this meeting. And we'll move right to council then. Thank you for the clarification. Sorry about that. Okay, we should go into that other meeting and tell people. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is a test. Uh, Mike, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thanks. I was having my problems. Thanks. Let me ask somebody from the clerk's office. How many counselors are with us? I believe we are good. I, I believe we have everyone. Oh, OK. So I see my I'm lit up here, so to speak, in a, an appropriate way. Uh, so we can just uh, continue. Yes, Mayor Savage, you are good to go. All right, All right folks, we'll begin with regional council. And uh, in the event that um, we finish early, everybody can go and do some local shopping on the streets of Sackville and Bedford and Dartmouth and Halifax and Porters Lake, Muscadab and Harbor, Spryfield, uh, North End, many other places. Okay, um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Does somebody want to consider the approval of minutes of November 24 and December the 1st? 
So moved by Councillor Cleary. Moved Seconded. By Councillor Russell. Seconded by Councillor Russell. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Affirmative. Minutes are approved. Approval of the order of business. Uh, Mr. Clerk. Mayor Savage, Councilor Morris has just dropped out, so we are just trying to get a hold of her to have her jump back into this meeting. So if we could just have a few seconds. Sorry, she was on and then she dropped off. All right, we'll just wait a sec. She may be in the other meeting I'm hearing from Trish. She, she sounds like she is. We're just going to grab her right now. So uh, Ian, would you lose uh, counselors at Edmonton? Will they much more well behaved. I feel like every municipality is is dealing with the COVID realities. <laughs> You're so diplomatic. Well done. <laughs> I thought he was going to say every municipality has a Tony. Oh, they, they only wish. <laughs> so just to confirm, Councillor Morse, I believe you are here now. Yes, I am. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. My apologies. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Clerk. Um, the order of business, uh, Mr. Speaker, no additions or deletions from your point of view. Mr. Clerk. Councillor Mancini, did you have anything? Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I would like to uh, see if Council would agree to add an item to the agenda. I did email uh, all uh, my colleagues uh, uh, this morning, and it's a re reference to uh, the uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, the Rapid Housing Initiative. Is it, uh, Mr. Clerk, should I read the uh, actual motion? Is that the best way to do this? So I believe the motion that will be required is a waiver of notice, not the actual motions that you're looking to make. Uh, and because it is a special meeting, there is a unanimous unanimous consent of all of council required to waive the notice. So uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I'm just asking for uh, everyone's uh, indulgence and allow me to add the item to the agenda, agenda and then uh, the motion we put on the floor, if approved, later uh, in the agenda and we can debate it and discuss it at that point in time. Councillor Cleary would second Councillor Mancini's uh, notice of a uh, waiver of motion. Thank waiver you, Councillor. Okay. Okay. Um, Leaving aside the actual uh, debate on the motion, then um, do I need? Can I ask for unanimous consent, or do I need to go on a roll call? Uh, I'll ask Ian that question. We are recording the vote, so it may be prudent to do the roll call. Okay. So Councillor Mancini is asking for waiver of notice. Requires 100% to add a, uh, a motion to the agenda which he has circulated. Are we ready for the question? Question. Question. Okay. District two. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. Sorry, in favor. Four, yeah. Councillor Purdy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. In favor. Seven, seven Councillor Mason. Mm, in favor. <laughs> Eight, Councillor Smith. I uh, get so in favor. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. And Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. 
In favor of the motion? District 13, Councillor Lovelace. Yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor? Deputy Mayor Outhit. What, a, what an opportunity, but yes, I'll vote yes. <laughs> District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Absolutely voting in favor of the motion. Mayor Savage. Muted, Mr. Mayor. You're on mute, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to say yes, but I'm afraid that uh, I'll say yes. And that has received unanimous approval. That'll be added to the agenda as uh, I guess as item 14. Uh, it'll be added to the agenda. OK, um, any other questions on the uh, agenda? If not, we'll need to um, get us uh, people's OK. Is everybody uh, all those in favor of the agenda as amended? Aye. 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 Those opposed? That's the agenda. On the consent agenda, Councillor Hensby has asked 1119 be taken off. Anybody else? If not, I'll ask somebody to move the consent agenda and then I'll read the items. Mr. Mayor, um, I would request that item 11.1.2 uh, be removed as well. 11.1.2 will be removed. I'll move the consent agenda as amended. Second, Councillor Cleary. Seconded by Councillor Cleary. Let's have a vote. numbers are that have been removed. I think I missed one. So, so the 11, items on the con sorry, Mr. Mayor. 11.1.2 has been removed. That's the facility operating agreement for Harriet's Field Williamswood and 11.1.9 tendering properties for tax sale have been removed from consent. 11.1.6, which is the new planning strategy land use bylaw amendments for West of Street. And 11.1.10 planning strategy and 530 Herring Cove Road are on the consent agenda. Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Cleary. Ready for the question? Question. 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 Starting in District 3, Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent, was that a Sorry, I'm having mic problems. I am in favor of this motion. District 4, Councillor Purdy. In favor. District 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. District 6, Councillor Mancini. In favor. District 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. District 8, Councillor Smith. For. District 9, Councillor Cleary. Yes. District 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. District 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. District 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. District 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. District 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. District 16, Deputy Mayor Outhit. Yes. District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. District 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. And Mayor Savage. I vote in favor, so that's the consent agenda. 11.1.6 and 11.1.10 11 are deemed to have been passed by consent, and I read those out. Number five, uh, calls for declaration of conflict of interest, colleagues. No motions are for, no motions are for decision. 
There is no deferred business. We do not have a public hearing. Correspondence. There is no correspondence that has been received for today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, petitions, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I no longer have that petition. Uh, there's more work to be done on it. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Councillor Cuttle, petition. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I received a petition from the Kitston Estates uh, Crosswalk Safety Committee. Um, they uh, have a petition with 298 signatures requesting a rectangular rapid flashing beacon for a crosswalk at Rockingstone Road and Beachstone Drive in District 11. Um, I just want to say that uh, this is something that they have been looking for for a while. Um, and you know, crosswalks and crosswalk safety is something that has been discussed at great length, I think, on the, on the council and with staff. Um, you know, just last night there was um, in my district, a pedestrian was hit by a vehicle on Herring Cove Road and um, I'll be submitting this petition with the hope that we can look at our crosswalk policy and find some solutions to our crosswalk issues. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Any other petitions, colleagues? There's no presentations, information items brought forward. We will move to reports 11.1.1. Proposed bylaw S1003 respecting regulation of sidewalk cafes to permit seasonal cafe owners. Councillor Mason, you'll take this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move that Halifax Regional Council adopt bylaw S1003. The purpose of which is to amend bylaw S1000 respecting the regulation of sidewalk cafes as set out in attachment C of the staff report dated October 19th, 2022. One, give the licensing authority discretion to consider the factors listed in section 15, including any mitigation when determining an annual sidewalk cafe license may be issued to an applicant. Two, give current seasonal sidewalk cafe license holders the opportunity to apply for an annual sidewalk cafe license prior to December 31st, 2020. And three, require owners to be responsible for sidewalk snow removal where sidewalk cafe licenses license is issued, I so move. A second. Second by Councillor Cuddle. Councillor Mason. So this is part of our ongoing COVID uh, response work and I thank staff for the rapidity of getting it here. I guess my question uh, if there is a staffer who can say, you know, I think we hope this would happen in November. It's now uh, December 15th. The uh, uh, annual, the second part speaks to licenses prior to December 31st, 2020. Should we amend that and move that forward right now or is that enough time to address the, the, the needs? Will the cafe folks be able to get an application in uh, between over Christmas and New Year's uh, and will staff be there to to respond to that. I mean, you're always there to respond in some capacity or another. I'm not saying that, but uh, it is a particularly busy time is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Who do we have for staff? Well, there we are. Uh, good, good morning, Mr. Mayor. My name is Hillary Hayes, Supervisor of Licensing for Planning and Development. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, um, we contacted all the businesses who currently have cafe licenses and let them know that this could be coming down the road, understanding that late in December, this approval would hopefully go through. Um, so we've been in touch with everyone and everyone who is interested has reached out. So over the next couple of weeks, we should be able to move it pretty quickly before the December uh, 31st date. But if people do want to apply after, they're more than welcome to. They just won't um, be included in that uh, waiver of fees for the 2020 season. All right, that was my only question. I support this and I hope uh, I have council support in that. Thank you very much, Ms. Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Ms. Hayes, to you and all the team who've been working hard on the patios to help our businesses who have been struggling, and I know they appreciate it. Uh, ready for the question, colleagues? Question. question. 
Starting in District 4, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes on this motion. Voting yes on this motion. District 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. 6, Councillor Mancini. Always in favor to hang out in the patio. 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. 8, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councilor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councilor Lovelace. Voting yes. Fourteen, Councilor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Fifteen, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. In favor, thank you. District 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. In favor of the motion. 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. And Mayor Savage. In favor, so that carries. Thank you uh, again to staff and thank you, Councillor Mason. Um, do one more item before lunch, colleagues. We'll do 11.1.2 facility operating agreement. Harriet's Field Williamswood Community Center. <clears throat> Councillor Cuttle uh, asked to bring this off consent. Councillor Cuttle, do you wish to put the motion on the floor and then take it away? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will do that. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council authorize the Chief Administrative yeah. Officer to negotiate and execute a facility operating agreement with the Harriet's Field Williamswood Community Center Association, substantially in the same form as set out in attachment one of the staff report dated October 29th, 2020. Seconded I'll by second Lovelace. That. Second by Councillor Lovelace, I heard. Uh, Councillor Cuddle. Um, yep, I'm hoping this can be um, quick. Um, I just want to say that, you know, this is a great example of how our community organizations um, really come together and run facilities like this in our municipality and the great service that they do to those who live in their communities. Um, my, uh, the reason I pulled this off of the uh, off of the consent agenda is um, it's, it's really about um, updating um, some language in HRM's agreements and on page five of the agreement um, it it uh, says that the facilities will be kept up here let me find it again sorry scrolling scrolling um, in a workman like manner and there is on page 22 of the agreement, um, and, you know, kind of a disclaimer to that saying, you know, that there's that all terms are gender neutral. But I thought this would be a good opportunity just to address language in our agreements that is gender neutral and, and see if we can find an alternative to that. Um, and when and moving forward, um, can, you know, update, update our agreements. I mean, that is just, you know, it's an example of how, you know, systematically in in all of our language and our documents, um, there is gender bias. So I'm, I'm just hoping we can make a motion to to change that language on page five of the service agreement, operating agreement. Does anybody like to speak to that, Mayor? Go ahead, John. Um, working like manner is a is a term used in legislation in many jurisdictions in Canada, and workman like manner is actually the term that has been considered by all courts right across Canada. And so um, there's a lot of work going on now with respect to gender neutral terms. I'm, I'm a little hesitant to take that out given the, the court's understanding of that is, is quite evolved over time. I would want to take that away and, and look at it in particular given, given the frequency with which it's used. And that's why we have used uh, the language we have at the end of the contract, which has been negotiated with the association as it is uh, to indicate that they're all gender neutral terms. It actually refers to the state of the work and, and there are certain tasks that the courts have recognized with respect to that term. Councilor Cuddle. 
Um, yep, and I and I know that the wheels of law turn slowly. I mean, I think by having a gender neutral clause is a reflection of the problem with the language in the first place. And so I'm hoping that as um, the you know as the law kind of updates its own terminology, we can update ours as well in our agreements. And there is no definition of what workman like is in this document in particular. And I'm wondering why we couldn't substitute something like. Um, you know, to a, you know, satisfactory or you know, well executed or some, you know, some other some other language like. If if council wishes to do to uh, defer on this matter, we can take it away and look at it. It is defined by the courts. There have been a number of decisions, courts of appeals in in just about every jurisdiction I'm aware of, have actually um, have judicial decisions which set out exactly what it means. And that's why we would not import that into a, a contract, as it were, to define it. I'm happy to take it away and see if it has evolved further at this point, but I, I'm a little hesitant to do that given the interest in moving this agreement forward. Um, so either either we can look at it to evolve our, our standard form agreement for the next agreement, or if you if council prefers, we can defer on this and, and we can take away and take a look at it. The, the, the key part is that there'd be no um, no um, uncertainty at the end of the day if there is a dispute that ends up going to court or otherwise as to what the term means. I, I'm not not particularly fussed with the language. I'd be happy to evolve it. I'm just cautious of doing so without without being clear as to what we end up. Councillor Councillor Cuddle, you okay with the lawyer taking that away? With John taking that away to have a look at that? Yeah, absolutely. I do not want to hold up this uh, agreement in any way, but I would like to look at language moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, ready for the question, colleagues? Ian? Question. Starting with District 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. In favor of the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Councillor Lovelace. In favor. Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. District 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. In favor. One, Councillor Daigle Gallon. The motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent. District 4, Councillor Purdy. In favor. Mayor Savage. In favor, thank you. And that motion carries and we'll give Councillor Kent a chance to vote uh, uh, when she comes back on if she wishes. Uh, okay, colleagues, that passes. We're going to take a break now. We're going to come back at 1 o'clock with 11.1.3. Uh, and I'm going to check with the clerk to see if I made a mistake here. Uh, but 11.1.3, colleagues, 1 o'clock. Thank you. That'll be a new screen, right, to Ian? That one? Yeah, we'll have everyone please leave this meeting and go to the meeting invitation for one o'clock when we come back.